Welcome to Respect, Relate, Connect, the official podcast for Living Room Conversations, a nonprofit organization focused on building understanding and bringing people together through guided conversations since 2010. Welcome to the Respect, Relate, Connect podcast. My name is Stuart Fletcher, and I will be your host. With me today are three of my guests, Robbie Lawler, Deborah Fletcher, and Cree Fletcher. If you can't tell, most of those last names are the same, and so we are related. I'm just going to get that out of the way to begin with. Deborah is my mom, and I'll be probably calling her mom through the rest of the podcast, and Cree is my sister-in-law. The opinions, perspectives, and experiences expressed in this podcast today are those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent what Living Room Conversation believes as a whole. Today, we're talking about parenting, protecting, and empowering children. This is a guide that's on our website, and you can go and you can find all the questions we're going to go through and all the other information at livingroomconversations.org. And the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves. So in this introduction, we're just going to share your name, where you live, what drew you to this conversation, and if this is your first conversation. And I'll go first, and this is kind of the order that will follow throughout the rest of the conversation. I'll go first, and then Robbie will go, and then Deborah, and then Cree, just so that everyone can understand the cycle in which we'll be trying to talk today. All right, so for me, my name is Stuart Fletcher. I live here in Utah. I'm going to Brigham Young University. And I am the social media manager for Living Room Conversation. So I guess that's really what drew me here. And this is not my first conversation, but it is the first episode of the Respect, Relate, Connect podcast. So in its own way, it's a first. I'm Robbie Lawler, and um, I live here in the beautiful Wasatch Front in the Western States. And what drew me to Living Room Conversations is I have known about them for quite some time, and I have done a conversation before, and I love their purpose and what they do. I think especially in today's society, you know, we, we've we lost the art of having a conversation without contention, and I'm as guilty as anybody, and so I have really learned a lot. I love their guides, has really helped us, not just as a community, but I think it really helps as a family and family communication, and I love that we're going to be talking about empowering and protecting children. Um, I have six kids, and 15, 15 hasn't been born grandchildren. <laughs> So I am Deborah. I have been in several of these conversations. I know some of the founders and some of the employees. I am a mother of 10. Stuart is my number five. And I do appreciate it very much, the power of being able to speak clearly and be understood. And um, it's a skill that I wish I knew when I was a young mother. So thanks for inviting me. For sure. I've had a lot of experience being mothered by her. (laughs) Overall positive, I would say. 10 out of 10. Good. (laughs) Good. (laughs) My name's Cree. I live in Minnesota. I originally am from Utah. We moved to Minnesota, my little family um, and I back in 2021. But um, beautiful place. If you ever want to come visit, shout out. And I am the mother of two young children. So I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and they're awesome. What originally drew uh, me me to this conversation, uh, this, uh, Stuart told me about it initially, but I, this is something that I've actually um, been thinking about a lot, talking with my mom friends a lot, this subject, and I'm, I'm excited to get into it. We're going to jump to the next section, which is called conversation agreements. Now, these are we don't like to call them rules because that sounds like it's more intense. But these are the guidelines for having as productive of a conversation as possible. And these points are really like the secret sauce to what makes living room conversations work, because without these set in stone before we begin, we're not creating the right environment to have the kind of conversations we want to have. 
We're going to go through, we're each going to read one. I'll read the first, Robbie will read the second, and then so on. So the first one is be curious and listen to understand. Show respect and suspend judgment. Note any common ground as well as any differences. Be authentic and welcome that from others. Be purposeful and to the point. Own and guide the conversation. And for anybody listening, and even for those of us here, pay attention to what one of those conversation agreements really sticks out to you. Which one might sound the hardest or which one might be an unfamiliar thing that you don't often do in conversation. And as we go along, try to keep that in mind and try to apply it as much as you can to what we're going to talk about today. So round one, before we get into the, the thick of the conversation, it's going to be a bit more of an introductory round. We're each going to get the opportunity for just one to two minutes to answer one of the three following questions. What are your hopes and concerns for your country, community, and or country? What would your best friend say about who you are? What sense of purpose, mission, or duty guides you in your life? And then we'll follow the same cycle as we've been following. For me, I guess the question I wanted to ask or answer would be, what would your best friend say about who you are? I think that's an interesting question. I never really considered that. I feel like my best friend would say that I am a very honest person, that I'm very authentic, that I have a terrible sense of humor, but that <laughs> that I'm at least self-aware enough to know my own strengths and my weaknesses and work towards improving my weaknesses. Okay, I, I think I'm going to try the last one what sense of purpose mission duty guides you in your life i think when you reach the ripe age that i am and you've seen a lot of things uh, i think your mission and what guides you kind of changes over time and i think right now for me it's just being a light uh, it just seems like the world, it's not the same world I raised my kids in. I see my grandkids being raised in it and uh, that there's still a ton of joy. There's still so much good out there. And unfortunately, what we see on the TV or social media or whatever, it's not always the light that we're seeing. We see a lot of darkness or <clears throat> light that's been kind of dimmed. And so I think that's kind of one of my purposes is just, you know, highlighting things that are good in us and in others and, and try to let that shine through. Yeah, I think I'll take the first one. My um... What I do for fun outside of my, my purpose as a mother and grandmother is um, an organization called Sustainable Families. And our biggest, our biggest focus and concern, which actually applies to my own family, my own community, the country, and actually the world, is um, how our agency is getting chopped away at one minute, like one little bit at a time. I, my hope is that when my children grow up and when my grandchildren grow up, Callum is my oldest grandchild, Cruz's uh, oldest son. And I wish that he, when he is my age, he can still make choices like I can make choices because we live in a, in a very open country that we're able to choose for ourselves where we would go. So if I can have any influence on that now so that those doors continue to stay open for my grandson and the rest of my posterity, then I've done my job as a mother. I guess I'll take the last one. I like that one. Um, I, uh, what sense of purpose, mission, duty guides in your life? And I think right now my stage of life is very, you know, young kids and looking to the future to see how they're going to be. And instead of doing that, while that is good and valuable, I think my purpose right now and my mission is to live day to day and just help my little kids be present, be children, be innocent. Um, it's that take a step back and 
just appreciate where I am, where we sit. And that right now is kind of what's guiding me, <laughs> getting through just day by day and being in the moment. <laughs> I remember those days really well, yes. right, Robbie? <laughs> we lived yep. some of those days together, so and I. <laughs> I have yet to live through any of those days. <laughs> you will. I'm no, sure you lived through them. You were just on the on the child end of it. <laughs> <laughs> on the other side, yeah, that's very true. All right, well, we are going to jump into round two, which will be really getting into the meat of our guide today. The guide is called Parenting, Protecting, and Empowering Children. And I chose this guide because we're, you know, barreling towards Mother's Day. And I feel like motherhood is something that clearly, you know, I don't have any experience with and never will. But it's something that affects almost everybody I know. The amount of people who grew up with single mothers or, you know, mothers is the vast majority, very few people grow up without a mother. And those that do, it's very hard. And it's hard even with the best mothers in the world. And so it's something that I wanted to really focus on today. So before we jump in, there's a big paragraph right at the top of the guide underneath the little picture. Do I have a volunteer to read that paragraph? That's kind of an introduction to the whole conversation. Is it for the past few generations? Yes. Okay, I'll read it. For the past few generations, Americans have been told to worry about stranger danger. The idea that mean people are roaming the streets, the malls, and even the aisles of the grocery store ready to snatch, hurt, and traffic children. The crime rate has plummeted since the early 90s, but fear for the safety of children has not. Instead, we have seen ever-increasing supervision of our children. Adult supervision has become so expected that parents can find themselves torn between upholding new social norms regarding supervision or feeling like they are unfit or negligent parents because they favor giving their children more freedom. Where do we draw the line between protecting our children and supporting their independence? Thank you. I think that that's a very important question. And we're going to find out kind of through our own experiences in these questions in this following round, where we kind of fall and how we understand that. So during round two, everyone's going to take about two minutes to answer each question below, or sorry, to answer a question below, without interruption, without crosstalk. When everyone has answered, that's when we're going to kind of more loosen up the format. We're going to open it up to more of a dialogue conversation based. So I'm going to read through these questions and then we're going to reverse the order. We're going to start with Cree and then go Deborah and then Robbie and then me. And then after I've shared my little two minutes, we'll open it up to everybody to talk back and forth, but just make sure that you keep those conversation agreements in mind. Try not to talk over each other. Make sure that we're putting curiosity and authenticity first. Round two, right? Mm -hmm. Round two. Okay. The question that initially I looked at when I went through here said, how have you seen adult supervision become more intense than it used to be? And where have you seen this play out in your own life? Um, I think I've seen this with like my mother, my mom, friends, and me. Just the way that different people interact with their kids on the playground. Um, for example, let's see. Um, I have very cautious kids and I don't think that my like helicopter parenting them, so to say, helps their anxiety levels. It makes them a little bit more cautious. And I, I've seen the spectrum of overly cautious moms and moms that do let their kids have a little more freedom. And the confidence levels in those children is um, pretty different and their ability to be able to just play. And so with, with, in regards to the playground, I feel like that can be translated into motherhood in general, just being overly protective and hyper-focused on helping to make sure that they take every little step perfectly and just, you know, letting them make their own mistakes. You, you learn from mistakes. That's the best way to figure out how to do stuff. Yeah, I, I 
I'm so amazed, Kree. Your your children are pretty brave, actually. <laughs> but they're still yeah, very they safe, very which is <laughs> yeah. it's really kind of cool. Uh, so it's interesting. I think I'm going to choose when have I felt safe giving my children unsupervised time. That's a very, very, very loaded question for me. Because first of all, I grew up in a country that wasn't very safe. Grew up in Guatemala. And uh, we don't have childproof houses to begin with. So I came with that as a context straight to college, then got married, had my first child. And even in a very safe apartment in Boston, because my husband went to MIT. So we had a, a little one, literally one bedroom. Um, I still felt like I needed to watch every corner. And then that kind of eventually I figured out that the child would be safe if I just did the right little things. There which wasn't very much because the house was the houses here are mostly childproof. You don't have windows that open to the street and you fall down, which like you do in my country. Um, but then uh, as they grew up, I can see the difference in my children. I love what you were saying about not being overly protective because that kind of scares them a little more. But, and I won't mention any names, but you guys know some names in my family. But my <laughs> oldest child was very, very reserved. And that was very hard because I was overly protective. I can see that now. We did live in Boston. I mean, Boston is not necessarily the place you just let your child out. And it was my first child. But you can see from, from my oldest to your husband, he cured me out of my fear. That kid just went and he was social and he just did and he was safe. And by the time he was old enough to, to go and do stuff, we were in Maine. And um, actually where I met Robbie, and we had the, the, an idyllic place to live. Uh, kind of a busy road, but we had a big back lot. And I remember the day that I kind of got shaken out of my fear. I, I couldn't find Brad for a couple of minutes. And I was really worried, even though we had this beautiful backyard. And, and he was up on the top of this massive tree. Now, the kid was like, I don't know, four, five. I don't know. We weren't there that long for him to be that much older. So because of him and because he was very, a very good climber, and so adventurous, I was able to break down my fears. And as we moved to Utah and Maryland, things changed a little because of the because of the environment we were in. In Maryland, it, it's a little it's a different country than Utah. You know, it feels like a completely different country. So, so yeah, I, I, by nature, I am a very uh, involved mother. I do not think I am a helicopter mother. I maybe Stuart can tell you otherwise because he's right in the middle of all of them. He'll have a pretty good opinion, but um, but yeah, I I think it, it is depending on the environment and having so many boys and they like to climb and explore and they get hurt too much. So I was on the protective side. <laughs> all right. Well, I I may just take the same question, <laughs> giving yourself <laughs> that or number one, which is at what age were you allowed to walk or play outside? But I guess I'm the exact opposite. I think my kids were probably raised the most unsupervised <laughs> of any children around, <laughs> the six of them. Um, you know, I was allowed to roam three, free. I grew up in a very, I granted, unique situation. My parents ran a home for children in California, a Masonic home for children. So it was a gated, huge community. I had 120 brothers, sisters. You know, it was a large group of other children, not just my family. So I never had that fear. And then when I married, uh, we lived in Maine, which was a relatively safe community. But I would say rather unsupervised. My kids were now the... I had a neighbor once call me and she said, I am looking at your house and there is a small child jumping out the window. They have moved the trampoline under the window from the third floor. I don't think it's safe. I, I probably had the opposite in that. And I can't imagine with social media now what it would have been like for me because it always hurt. But I got lots of criticism about some of the ways I might have raised my children and the, you know, they were just free to do whatever they, uh, 
They did have guidelines, however, and some were really good with that and some not so much. But, uh, you know, we look back now and it's amazing that no one was ever seriously hurt or <laughs> marred for life. But I also think all my kids would say they had a pretty good um, upbringing. I, I am so I have a daughter in law who is the sweetest thing, and they have chosen a different lifestyle that goes along with choosing the unsupervised in that she homeschools. She's decided, I, I, I was trying to look up the movement and I think it's called unschooling, but I, I can't, but there's a movement and they have a lot of groups, but she allows her children to be children. They live on a farm. Her children know how to do everything you can imagine, milking cows and chickens, and they know the cycle of life with things with animals on the farm, but they've just chosen a lifestyle to let their kids be kids in a very, and it's it's a safe environment because it is their home and, and what they choose to do, but the kids can try anything. They ski, they do just you name it, they can they can try it. So I just think the topic is so interesting and I'm probably going off because I can remember teaching my kids a song about stranger danger. <laughs> and and it's just a sad environment that we live in today that that is so prevalent because I do think it's a strange balance because we're robbing them of their childhood and there was nothing better. I, I can remember my, you know, mom calling everybody for dinner and, you know, everyone's down the street, <laughs> you know, a hundred places. You wouldn't go home till it was dark. Now yeah. that's, that's not always the case. And I think we've let things into our, I mean, this is my personal, we've let things into my, our homes and I, I see it in friends. I see it in other extended family or whatever. Nobody was sitting home watching TV, especially in the summer. <laughs> we were out, mm -hmm. we were doing, mm -hmm. you know, so it does put a lot on our parents today to be able to keep our kids active and moving and, and yet aware that there is real danger out there. But yeah, so I'm probably not a great one because I was pretty unsupervised. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> Well, the, the question I'm going to answer is the last one. What are the upsides and downsides of walking and playing outside without constant adult supervision? I always thought that I was a pretty like autonomous, unsupervised kid. Yeah. Obviously, we weren't like there were lots of rules. If you ask it, especially my older siblings, they'll be like, oh, we my parents are so strict so we can do anything. And I'm like, I have <laughs> memories of my childhood, like playing on top of a chicken coop and jumping onto a trampoline. Like we did that same kind of thing. We strung a rope between two trees and tried to do like a tight walk. But I mean, that's <laughs> super dangerous. And we were like 20 feet off the ground and none of us could balance at all. <laughs> and So those seem to be the upsides and the downsides at the same time. But I think really the heart of that question is like, where, where do you draw the line between giving kids independence and giving kids structure because i think people we we thrive off of both we need both but how do you make sure that you're giving the right amount of each to children and that's a question i want to open to you guys because obviously i've never raised kids but another question i i want you to consider as we're going into the more of this open form of this conversation is we talk about stranger danger and in my head, especially as a kid, I grew up in the early 2000s. And so stranger danger to me was like a man in a dark cloak, like walking down the street, snatching yeah. kids, putting them in his car. But stranger mm -hmm. danger today is in your home. It's on your computer. It's on your phone. It's, mm -hmm. it's all around you. And we, like the guide says, it has gotten safer in terms of like, violent crime but it's also we've become more vulnerable to those kinds of intrusions into your house there are children 
who are raised on iPads at, you know, two, three years old, their kids. I just heard a statistic yesterday. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think 81% of people now in Gen Z get a cell phone with the internet, with social media at 11 and 12 years old. So that's letting the entirety of the human existence of stranger danger into their pocket day and night. So I'm just wondering what, what do you guys think in terms of autonomy versus boundaries and also the modern version of stranger danger? Uh, I just wanted to say one thing because I think, uh, and I'm out there to relate to the moms. I remember clearly, uh, you know, the kids were probably probably junior high, but maybe not quite that, or maybe a little younger. And I was in tears and I went to my husband and I was just like, it makes me emotional. Think of it. I did not sign up to be a police officer. And that's what I've turned into. And I hated myself. I just, I didn't like having to patrol and to be this police officer. So with that regard and stranger danger and all the social media and everything there is today, we just, you know, a wise man once said, teach them correct principles. And then you do have to let them govern themselves to some extent. I mean, I'm going to be there. I'm not going to let some huge harm come to my kids. But I do think there is a huge responsibility now. Parents today, much more than even in my day, have a responsibility to teach children. You know, it's and that teaching can come by the things you do with each other. And and just because they're going to have to put those principles to practice. And that's when you wish the safety net was there or did you remember, you know, but um, and 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 they teach the best teaching, too, is, is by um is by example. Can I say one example? <laughs> they taught me. <laughs> so I probably, this is probably child number six. The van is loaded with kids. We are running late. Not uncommon. I am very <laughs> pregnant, very pregnant. And it's hot. It's kind of summer-ish. And I pull out onto uh, one of the you know streets we were living in Maine at the time. And in front of us walks a probably homeless, good chance, but maybe not, but very intoxicated, very drunk, older man. And he's walking across the street. My reaction was, would you be any slower? I got some place to go. Not kind. And of course, he made it halfway through the street and he fell down. And it was my kids that said, and they're young, mom, you got to go help him. Aren't you going to go help him? And I'm like, okay, I've taught you to be charitable and this is what you're supposed to do, but am I willing to do it at this point? So I did, and I'm sure it was a hysterical scene because, of course, he couldn't move, and I could not move him. And I tried to drag him to the curb. Luckily, a really good Samaritan stopped and helped me get him to the curb. But the example to me is that they know their children are so you know, when we teach them young, they understand those things. They know what the right thing is to do. And yes, it, it's the it's the stranger danger that's mixing the message up, especially with what they view and see online. It, it's trying to change that message around. But in the end, they uh, they do know. And I, and I think I have six very charitable, very concerned with others and that's really good and um you know and they um but bad things happen I, I don't mean to dis you know and bad things have happened to my kids um but I I think they've learned they've grown and as parents we can't control it all we do the best we can in at the time and with what we have 
That's beautiful. And you know, it's interesting because uh, Stuart does not, did not consult me on who he should be inviting to this conversation, obviously. Mm-hmm. So it's really kind of very timely that I can thank you in the air, um, Robbie, for your example. Mm-hmm. I, I remember that, you know, your youngest child was my, the age of my oldest child. So we were literally barely overlapping. And Raz and I have talked over the years how God sent us from very, very, very uptight Boston when everything is proper and quiet and sit still and wear suits to dinner to very relaxed Maine. And that we got to meet you and your husband because we absolutely love your children. We still do. We we have kept in touch with some of them and and how it was it was so important for us to see how your children were developing, how they were wonderful and kind. And yes, they were all over the place and they were running around and they weren't sitting still. And um, I helped us move up from that overly tight thing. We didn't move all the way up, (laughs) but we we relaxed. So I I am grateful to you because I think Stuart couldn't couldn't have told you the story about him going over that tight rope if it wasn't that we met you once in our lives, like 10 years before that. Plus, what Stuart might not know, I was watching from the kitchen window and there was an older brother here and an older brother there watching to see how soon they will fall. And they took one step and they couldn't even so. So the, any, do you know what I mean? So so in my mind, um, the, I've seen both extremes of motherhood. And I don't think you're in an extreme, actually, Robbie. You were a very responsible mother. <laughs> but I've seen people that are actually neglectful. But I also have seen people that have a child so that they can look good to the world. I think that to me is more dangerous because I have seen so many women that are like, you know, I need to raise this child just perfectly because I want to look good to somebody else. And to me, that's a dangerous motivation because it cuts the autonomy of the child. And like I said in the beginning, it cuts away their agency because they no longer live for their best life. They live to show off for their mother. And that is so not fair for the child. But in in the middle there, I, my as uh, some of, uh, I assume you, you, my children know, my most important job is motherhood. And it's been my full-time career from, from even before they were born. I, I wanted to be the best mother they could possibly have. And I, um, <clears throat> I definitely haven't measured up to that, but I have intentionally gone to school. Like I went to BYU, I studied family science and psychology just so that I could do my best. But still, like I said, that's, Every child is so completely different. And I'm not suggesting that we have to get a degree on this. It's just, I wanted to get a degree and that happened to be one that I thought I could use for my full-time job. Um, But I think it comes down to me about the autonomy versus um, just helicoptering people. It has to be connected to the level of developmental stages, right? And capabilities. I'm not going to let a Mm two-year-old go do something that a two-year-old cannot do. But of course, I would let a, 12, let a 12-year-old go hike, go with the scout troop and go get lost in the wilderness like actually Brad did. I'm sure you heard this story, Cree. They left him behind. Yeah. <laughs> they completely forgot the kid. But luckily, he was intelligent enough to find the road and find his way home. Right. So um, I, there, there, there's a context, I think, to, to how much one allows and how much it becomes about yourself and how much is about giving the best child the opportunity to grow. And even then there's a layer, another layer because they have very different personalities. Uh, all my children are completely different. So I could have let this 12 year old do this, but not this other 12 year old. I like that. Um, I actually wanted to t- touch on a couple different points that both of you brought up Stuart when you were talking about stranger danger I've said this before but growing up in the 90s and the early 2000s like that like the 2000s is when Elizabeth Smart was kidnapped that's my she's like a couple years young older than me and that I feel like was like one of those moments that just really affected my brain (laughs) and um I think it really affected my parents too I don't know who wouldn't be affected by something like that. But um, you mentioned that that stranger danger and and technology has kind of brought that inside the home. And I think that one of the ways I don't know, I don't know what the best way is to 
guided around that and to help your children. But the, the way that I can think of is just by having those open lines of communication. Definitely. I don't know. My, my children are both five and two. They don't have tablets or iPhones yet, but being able to teach them to listen to their gut and to kind of just listen to their intuition whenever they meet someone that gives them bad feelings or me keeping those open lines of communications with them, knowing who they're being or they're around, what they feel when they're by those people. Um, you never know who's going to be a predator in your child's life. So it's just a good thing. I'm not going to be able to, to know. I hope that I'd be able to help them. But the best way I can think of to help them navigate that danger would be to train them to listen to their in intuition, to be able to have the conversation with me that someone doesn't feel right in their life or that someone approached them with a, a strange question or, you know, just stuff like that. Thinking back on my own life and the dangerous things that we did. Uh, Robbie, you said that your kids jumped out of windows. We did that too. Like, I don't know if I would let, let my kids do that right now. Probably, I think I probably should eventually be able to let them do that. I want to get to a point where I'm able to supervise and to know uh, I, if they're going to break their neck, um, then I'll tell them no, but they're just falling on a tramp. It's okay. They're just jumping onto a mattress. I don't know. Um, but for me, being able to like figure out, is their life in immediate danger right now? Or are they just going to break a bone? Because broken bone, like, while that's not very awesome, it's not like life threatening. It's okay. So those are my thoughts on what you guys said. <laughs> I guess kind of the central question is, at least to me, how do you make sure that you trust your kids? Because they're kids. Kids are dumb. Like I, I've, yeah. I've been around kids my whole life and they're, I'm dumb. They're, exactly. <laughs> and like, we're all, none of us really know what we're ever doing. It's like the, the essence of humanity is lifelong imposter syndrome, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but you're the parent, you have two to three times more experience in life and you you know what you think you know at least you know what's right and what's wrong and you've read every book and you've prepared every way and your kid goes contrary to what the book says or whatever how do you build trust in your kid when you have seen them go literally from nothing into their own person yeah can i, I answer yeah. <laughs> go ahead i was just gonna say i don't for me i also have a whole life of overthinking there, one thing that I think is valuable for kids is they're coming at us with a, in a, with a fresh perspective and yeah, they don't know a lot of what's, they don't know like book stuff. I don't know, but they do still have intuition. It's just kind of figuring it out. I don't know. That's kind of my thought on that. You go ahead, Robbie. I don't know if you no, probably I have something better say to say. <laughs> from, no, from my perspective at this age, I think the 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 trust issue um, that you talked about, you know, how, how can you trust them that uh, Stuart said, you're judging that what what are, you know, parenting is not zero to 18. <laughs> parenting is a lifetime. And so I have to trust, you know, when they're, I like to think of the junior high, high school years as basically brain dead for some of my, <laughs> your, your reasoning skills are not at their highest, but that's, if I were to judge, you know, what are you saying, you know, is, oh, how successful or did, could I trust them then? No, there's been times I can't trust at all, but I trust them over the lifetime. And I just think sometimes you have to take a step back. And when bad things happen or they made bad choices, if you ask them, they they learned from those, they grow from those, which is, which is, I think, as a parent, what you want, that you've instilled like a foundation, a ground floor that there's going to be ups and downs just like there is for our lives. But to look at parenting more long term, to look at it as a lifetime of parenting. And once your kids are married with kids, you're still their parent. <laughs> you know, you're still your parenting style changes and what you say and you don't say. But 
I just think if parents could look more long term and not be so hard on themselves and not be so uh, judgmental about, oh, they did this. It must not have worked what I was saying. And then my last thing is to enjoy the whole thing, you know parenting and being it's awesome have fun and I loved the crease got it don't be in such a hurry I was in such a hurry to get to the next stage the next stage you know oh, I can't wait till there's none of these in the house <laughs> you know, none of these kids, <laughs> teenagers when I say that. I can't wait till they're gone and my house is clean finally yeah you know no <laughs> you know it's just it's slow down don't be in such a hurry don't be so hard on on yourself and know that this is life, you know, and they're going to make mistakes. And I made a ton of mistakes as a parent, but it's OK, because I got a whole lifetime, a whole lifetime. So no judgment. I love that. And it's uh, again, um, I'm sure we all can relate to the idea that we learned from other people. We mm-hmm. are completely growing up as parents. We're still growing up. And, and, you know, I'm so grateful to see that my grandchildren are in good hands. My two daughters-in-law are absolutely <laughs> brilliant in the way that they can relax and still take care of the children so well. And, and what a brilliant uh, piece of advice, Cree. I wish you could have been my mother-in-law and tell me, <laughs> hey, just let them follow their intuition. You know, I did not get that kind of advice. I had very, very uptight parents and uh, in-laws. But um, I think... I specifically two people I want to thank. Um, I remember my sister-in-law, Catherine, she said, don't worry so much about the first child, which just sounds terrible because that poor mm-hmm. first child, but she said, you really have to learn so much through that poor kid and God is going to understand. He's like the first pancake is how she put it. I think that's funny. I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> like Sometimes it burns. Sometimes you don't know how to like get the, get the right temperature. And that's, that's absolutely terrible because I have a great first child, but but she was right in the sense that you're really trying to figure out who you are as a parent. You don't even know who you are. You've never had a kid, right? And then the other yeah. person I want to thank is my friend Deborah from Bountiful. If she ever hears this, she said to me one time, and this again for the first child, he was learning how to get himself out of our overly tight grip, which I definitely don't recommend. Don't be overly grippy to your children. <laughs> that was not a good idea. But he was trying to kind of let go of that a little. And he was like 16 and 17, trying stupid stuff. And he said to me, you need to trust your child a lot more than you think. And there was something deep about that. Because in so many ways, I was worried that I was doing a a poor job as a mother, right? So when I, I was critical of mothers that did things for themselves just a few minutes ago, but looking back... I was so worried about whether or not I was going to look good as a mother to, I don't know who, my mother-in-law, my neighbor, God, whatever that was, it was, it was based on fear instead of being based on complete love. If my motivation, which is something I've tried to learn over the years, you know, if my motivation was to love that child and what was best for the child, not what it looked like in my motherhood resume, then, then I could have been a different parent. And I, I think that's why God gave me 10. Because I needed to practice and practice and practice. And still I was going to say, get to the perfect kid when it's the fifth child <laughs> right in the middle. But then seeing how I raised Robert and how I am raising Rose, it's a different world. I mean, my children even laugh at me. It's like, what? What do you mean? She just goes off and she has a car and she do, 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 and she does her hair in different colors. What? <laughs> well, it's the yeah, principle of different. the bell curve, right? Um, I that's a terrible joke. I shouldn't say that. But I didn't hear it. I, didn't I said the, it. The, the principle of the bell curve is like the f- the first is down here and the last is down here. But once you get to that middle kid, it's the peak. It's the best. I'm the fifth too, so we're good. Fifth and ten. <laughs> yeah, that would make me my little brother Scotty, who share the middle. We're we're the best, apparently. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you guys all joining me today. We're going to go into the the last round, and this will be a little bit of a quicker round because it's kind of a reflection on our conversation. Round three, everyone's going to take two minutes to answer one of the following questions. What was the most meaningful slash valuable to you in this living room conversation? What learning, new understanding, or common ground was found on the topic? How has this conversation changed your perception of anyone in this group? 
Is there a next step you would like to take based upon the conversation? And then I'll go first and we'll go back into that original order. I guess the most meaningful thing to me was uh, what Cree said about letting you trust your kids intuition, which I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. I've always been a big believer in like gut feelings and intuition and going with what you feel to be true. And statistically, that's how most people make their decisions. We actually, we may read as much as we want. We may be as educated as we want, but when it comes down to the wire, we make our decisions based off how we feel. And I guess I, I never really considered the idea that like, of course, little kids have that same thing. I've seen little kids make those kinds of decisions. Yeah. You know, my, my little nephew, Jay, it was so funny. I watched him go into the kitchen cabinet and grab a big glass plate. And he said, set it down so gently. There was no way for him to know that it was going to shatter. And I've seen kids shatter plates, <laughs> But somehow he knew he could like feel the weight or he could feel the size or something. He was nervous enough to be like, let me put this down gently and take care of this little thing. And watching him do that, I was like, oh, yeah, it's interesting. Little kids, they, they can make as many right decisions as we can. And I liked what Robbie said about how parenting, it doesn't end at 18. Which, I mean, sounds kind of nice, I guess, if you're struggling, if it's stressful, you're like, oh. I'm almost there. Two more years, three more years. But yeah, it's right. I remember my dad saying parenting actually becomes more difficult after 18 and costs more money. <laughs> it gets <Yeah>. more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, that was meaningful to me to consider that parenting is a lifelong thing. And all through your life, you have to trust your kid's intuition. Um, I, I'm, I'll be short. I'll take my two minutes. I'm probably going to do a hair on each, uh, the next step after based on this conversation. And then what did I learn or understand, you know, as a grandparent, you, you just push in and whoosh out, you know, (laughs) I'm not like, I don't constantly live that anymore. And I have three, I mean, all my kids, amazing and three amazing mom daughters who are doing such a good job, but they're raising kids. They, they, they work from home. So they're there, but they are busy. (laughs) They're working. And so that's its own complicating uh, factor. But I just realized from this conversation that I maybe need to help my grandkids more and give them more freedom like experiences that would help alleviate some of that. It's hard to be spontaneous when you're working from home and you have to, you know, but just to remember the unstructuredness and and give opportunities for kids and um in my grandkids life. And my realization is what Deborah said. I always thought you were unsupervised. I had no idea you saying today that you were really wanted everything proper and everything. So you, you pulled it off well, dear, because I, I would have had, uh, I would have had no idea. And I will say just my last thought is just uh, in closing a thank you to my mother who was awesome and uh you know raised all of us great and her one saying that my kids all know is the secret in parenting and empowering children or whatever is no way know when to sway like a palm tree or stand firm like an oak tree and it's always stayed with me and yeah there's just either an oak or a palm and and figuring out what situation and I love what you said situations are different and ages are different and just knowing when to do the two is great so in a proper way of motherhood um Kree you starting on this but Robbie and I have had experience of show and tell Remember those mornings? <laughs> it's so until today. Oh no! Uh-huh. Why do we write mom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thirty five years of parenting, and here's my show and tell for you. So that uh, is the lady of parasol from a French painter, Monet. But if you see it from very, very, very close, oh, it's a beautiful. bunch of mess, right? And Cree, you're an artist. You get this right here. It's just a bunch of random strokes and messy. 
Mm-hmm. And um, and I think to me, that's the biggest thing that I've learned today. Robbie, thanks for saying that. Thanks for saying that. Just relax because I'm still my myself is still myself, right? Even though I've learned a little bit in life, I'm still like, oh my gosh, I have these grandchildren. And my some of my children are married, blah, 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 and I still have kids at home. So it's good to to have this conversation 29 years after we met, you know, <laughs> and I've, I, we've been in each other's lives on and off. And I've seen some of your, your pain. I, you've seen some of my pain, but it's really fun to remember. Okay. At the end of the day, parenting is like a, a painting, like this, this kind of painting, the, the abstract painting that this stroke, that this, this dark, messy, black spot spot in the bottom of that grass is meant to be there is and because one of the things that i have learned the hard way i don't know how much i'm teaching my children or how much i have taught them even though you know we all mothers try to be the best we can and we think we're all that but at the end of the day they're teaching us there's Mm -hmm. no way i could have learned the lessons that i know about life without them right every single one of them especially the ones that have given me the hardest time. If it was a bunch of really sweet little angels that just floated and came in a tuxedo to dinner, singing like Beethoven, like humming Beethoven, whatever it is, then my life wouldn't have grown. I would have, I won't have a foundation of, of the pain that you feel as a mother and of the joy that you feel as a mother. So my painting would look like my white wall. You know, it would not look like this morning, I think. So I am, I am grateful to my mother, of course, but I am grateful to my children and my daughters-in-law that I, I always, every time I'm with me and I can't wait, I'm going to see you tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to Minnesota to go see you. (laughs) And I just (laughs) saw you. I know it's good timing. And then um, I just got back from Arizona to see my other mother-in-law and I feel bad because sometimes they become my counselors. I'm like, oh, please help me out, you know? And it's been such a joy especially when I have raised so many men, having women in my life and having <laughs> sweet two girls. And of course, Caitlin too. She, she's not, um, she doesn't have a child yet, but she's still a, a good friend, my three daughters-in-law. And um, anyway, that's, that's my little gratitude for my children and for my daughters-in-law and uh, for all the, the mothers out there that have taught me like Robbie has, that life is not about me. It just isn't. It's about the other people I serve and how much I can possibly love them and forgive. There's a lot of forgiveness happening in motherhood, but especially, and I think Robbie, you agree with me, forgiving ourselves because we did the best we could with what we had. And sometimes we just didn't know any better because I was 20 when I had my first kid and it was an intentional choice and it was a solemnized marriage and everything, but I was still 20. And I don't know about any 20 year old that I see now thinking, oh my gosh, you should not be a parent. <laughs> I really appreciate like both of your perspectives and, and like Deborah, like you said, I was, I was only 26 when I had Callum. I'm, I'm, I'm not like, it's so funny to think back to my mindset when I was 18 and then, and then 20 and 23, 26, just because I felt so big and I was so ready to take on the world. And I was so excited, but, and I'm only 32. So it's not, I, I still feel like, oh, I've got a lot of life experience, but there's so much that I haven't experienced yet. There's so much that I haven't experienced in motherhood. And so looking at both of you and your examples and hearing what you're saying, I mean, I'm still learning. I'm still, and I, Callum and I actually, my, my five-year-old, we have conversations about this a lot. One time I, I was very immature in the way that I handled something. And I just went out to him and I said, you know, I've never had a five-year-old before and you've <laughs> never had, um, uh, this is both of our first times. I've never had a five-year-old boy and I've never had a two-year-old girl. So this is new to me. And I just want you to know, I'm so sorry. We're just experiencing life together and we love this. Right. And he, he's very gracious and he, he, um, it's like, yeah, mom, we're new. I've never had a 32 year old mom before. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> we're going to make it. But, um, I think, yeah, just, just listening to what you guys are, are saying, you ladies are saying and, and listening to your wonderful, wonderful perspectives as, as mothers and, and grandmothers and hearing 
you know, it's going to be okay. Like the world still exists. We're still producing people and we're all going to be fine. Just take it one at a time. (laughs) Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I I feel like I learned a lot. I don't know when I'll be able to apply any of it, but (laughs) I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to do a a quick outro here for the podcast and then I'll let you go. But again, thank you very much. I really appreciate all the different perspectives. If you as the listener enjoyed this conversation, one of the beauties of living room conversations in general is that you can have your very own version of this exact conversation. If you go to livingroomconversations.org and you download the Parenting and Protecting and Empowering Children Guide, you can literally have the same kind of experience that we had today. I'd invite anyone to go download the guide and have this conversation with your own mom, because I'm sure you'll learn a lot from that. All of our guides are free. All of our resources are free. We are a nonprofit. The work that we do to heal divides and bring communities together is all done through donations. And you can donate at our website or join our Patreon to get exclusive content. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Living Room Convo and on Facebook and YouTube at Living Room Conversations. But just in general, I want to make sure that I invite you all to start the conversations that really matter. Connection is honestly the only way to really find happiness and belonging starts with conversation.